Who could you please give a warm welcome to our guest, Mr. Terry McMahon? So, for those of us who are not aware, uh, Terry has directed some of Ireland's great feature films, such as Charlie Casanova, Patrick's Day, and uh, this year marks the release of his new film, Made in Nigeria, The Kiss of Death. So, Terry, I wanted to go back to the beginning. You wrote over 100 episodes of Fair City, and <laughs> for your sins. And uh, around 15 years ago, I remember listening to a story, you, were, um, you drank some whiskey one night and you were staring at a, a Facebook post button. You were thinking, you were dreading the thought of posting a, a post on Facebook about a call for crew for a, a feature film called Charlie Casanova. So I want to take you back to that time in your life. What were the thoughts, what, what, why were you so dreading that post, what was, the, what was the motivation behind your anxiety when you were going to put yourself out there to make this feature film? Okay, uh, the first thing is I know there are many different levels of experience in the room. Some of us have worked together, some of us haven't. I know there are people who are making their first short film. I know there are people who are making their fourth fucking feature. So it's fantastic that you have this group of people in this room. And ra rather than waiting for the end of the Q&A, if you want to interrupt or ask any questions, please fucking ask them. All I can do is I promise I'll be as honest as possible. I've made four films. Three of them are features and one is a documentary. I made one of them within the system and three of them outside the system. So I know both sides of the fence. I know the bullshit that goes on on both sides of the fence and I know the possibilities of both sides of the fence. In terms of the question, this was uh, 14 years ago and I really didn't understand how social media operated. But I was drunk and fucking stupid, and some of the best actions you can do in your life happen when you're drunk and stupid. And I, put a, I had written a script called Charlie Casanova, and I wrote it because I had written over 100 episodes of Fair City, which is like injecting poison into the nation and getting paid for it. But I was a whore, and I learned to bend over, and I did it as required for the money, unashamedly. But I knew that if I didn't write something that came from a different source, I'd be a whore my whole fucking life. So I wrote this script about the nature of class hatred in our country. And this was at a time when we didn't discuss things like DEI or all these invented scams, and we still don't discuss class to this day. But I was drunk and I typed into Facebook, intend making no budget feature, Charlie Casanova, need cast, crew, equipment, and a lot of balls. This is sincere, so bullshitters fuck off in advance. And I posted it. And I went to bed about two o'clock in the morning. And then I woke up at four o'clock in the morning going, what the fuck did I just do? It's embarrassing. But by the time I got to the computer, there was over 120 responses. And there was a link to the script. The one proviso was you had to have read the script in advance. And those 120 people, all of them wanted to work on the project, even though they knew there was no money involved. And we ended up making that film on borrowed cameras over an 11-day period. And it went from being an impossible film to being picked up by Studio Canal for distribution in UK and Irish cinemas. And then it went from there to being fucking destroyed by the Irish critics and the Irish system. And then you're in a situation where you think you'll never make another movie again. But I'm sure like all of you in this room understand, yearning to make movies is a kind of sickness. It's a kind of addiction. And regardless of the outcome, you try to make something again. And we made another movie. And that other movie was a film called Patrick's Day. And the same people who despised Charlie Casanova loved Patrick's Day, and the same people who adored Charlie Casanova fucking despised Patrick's Day. So again, you learn you cannot control what an audience is going to think, what they're going to feel, what they're going to see. 
But the one thing you can do is try to protect the thematic question, the reason for making the fucking thing in the first place. And if you're making films to be famous or to get laid or to get rich, you're a fucking moron. But if you're making films because you want to ask questions that make you uneasy and possibly make the audience uneasy, you're still a fucking moron, but at least you're doing it for the right reasons. So the mantra of Kino D. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Terry McBatten, guys. <laughs> the mantra of Kino D is make movies, not excuses. And throughout this weekend, some of you guys will tap into an energy that you didn't know you had in you. So over those 11 days, you made a film that became the first ever Irish film to premiere at South by Southwest. What were the attributes that you tapped into that allowed you to manifest this film, your vision of this film into existence? Again, it's that idea, if absurd as it sounds, when you make a film, everything is fiction, including your own fear. So the idea of scratching, itching a scar, a scar that has been grown over for quite some time. If you're uncomfortable and increasingly, exponentially uncomfortable about the subject matter you're interrogating, then you're probably on the right track. If you're increasingly comfortable and self-satisfied with what you're interrogating, then you're a fucking whore again. There's no point in examining something that does not make you uncomfortable. But in the process of a thematic question that comes out of that difficult, difficult, embarrassing secret, you can end up creating something that surprisingly survives pre-production, post-production, and hits an audience in a dark room. So with Charlie Casanova, we were selected for South by Southwest. We were the first Irish film ever selected for competition. We were the first non-American film to be selected in six years. And again, this is not a bitching fest against Screen Ireland. But to give you an idea of how that structure works, despite being the first film ever selected, we were treated like pieces of shit. The Irish contingent who went over on our coattails were put up in the fanciest hotels in Austin, Texas. We were staying in a shithole 26 miles outside town. So that's how they're treated, and that's how we're looked on. And that's how most of you in this room are seen. And it's not deliberately selective. It's hierarchical, it's class-based, it's all these things. So when they bring in all these sub supposed inclusion and diversity and equity nonsense, they're actually excluding people even further. But once you realize that you're outside the system, curiously enough, it gives you a freedom. Because when you're in the system, their greasy fingerprints are all over the project, on every level. In Screen Ireland, even though these people are getting paid by taxpayers' money, they behave as if they're producers they get executive producer credit, and they get editorial control. Now, even in Hollywood, they wouldn't seek editorial control, and yet they do it here. RT does the same fucking thing. So in terms of the kind of films that you want to make, in terms of the reason, the drive to make these films, to answer your question, the drive to make the film has got to be bigger than your fear and your ego. It has got to be something that you're willing to sit with for the next few years. It's got to be something that makes you understand that despite the fear and despite the accolades, Charlie Casanova was despised, but it was also won awards around the world. I've known what it is to win awards, to win big awards. I know what it is to be fated. I know what it is to be exalted. And it's all bullshit. Because the reason you're making the film should be nothing to do with those. And the reason you're making the film is to reach somebody in a dark room who you might never talk to. Bizarrely, in this new internet age, people were able to contact us in a remarkable way. But when you reach somebody in a dark room, that's the power of cinema. And whether it's a short or a feature, it doesn't matter. And from our experience of making films, the only way you're going to reach somebody in a dark room is by having the courage to go into that unknown place that you think you're the only one that feels it, and yet somebody in the audience will feel it. Is this making any fucking sense to you? <laughs> yeah, and... Um just to, in case people don't know, Terry didn't go to third level education. Terry didn't complete his leaving cert. And oftentimes I will use excuses, which we don't allow here in Kino, to say that I haven't gone to film school 
I haven't completed a third level degree. Well, here you have a man who didn't even finish his leaving cert and has won the highest award for screenwriting in this country, which I think is, you know, a hell of a testament. That's bullshit. <laughs> if you put a value system in place that thinks that the fucking leaving cert, which is an example of acquiescence, appeasement, and control, if you think that's your barometer of character judgment, you're fucked anyway. That's what, that's what we're kind of taught to do. So you can move outside of that, that frame of mind. That's the point I was trying to make. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Engineering, I suppose. Anyway, so moving on from that, uh, obviously, you've, as you said, you directed within the studio system. You've also directed Charlie Casanova that was made for around 900 euros. What was the main difference, or what were the main differences in working with a bigger film and a smaller film, and how did it affect your directing style? Absolutely no difference. And it's something that we really need to remember. I, uh, again, I was essentially an extra on a Christopher Nolan film, and I got to watch firsthand what happened with Christopher Nolan and his cinematographer, Wally Fisher. And all that mattered to them was what was captured in front of the lens of a camera. The rest, nobody gives a fuck about. The pain, the joy, the orgies, the fucking loneliness, whatever it is, and everything in between, nobody cares. The audience only cares about what is captured in front of the lens of a camera. And what is captured in front of the lens of a camera, particularly with the incredible technology that you have available to you now, your phones, your phone captures better image than a camera 30 years ago would have cost a quarter of a million euro. Think of that idea. Go back to television that you used to watch. A lot of you are young, some of you would, uh, would remember television shows from the 80s. Look at those television shows. They, they look like shit. Your phone has the capacity to record better sound and better picture than something that would have co cost a quarter of a million. That's an astonishing revolution. And yet it's not being utilized in that way. All that matters is what, what is captured in front of the lens and how it is cut together. And the juxtaposition of two shots and the impact that, those, that that juxtaposition has on you, the viewer. That's the alchemy. And that alchemy not only hasn't changed, it's actually more protected than ever. Because when it happens, it becomes visceral. It's not intellectual, it's not technological, it's a visceral response. So there's no difference between, Charlie Casanova costs less than a thousand euros. That doesn't mean in any real sense. It means that everybody worked for free and everything in post-production was given for free. The, the money that we spent was for food. Patrick's Day, I think, cost 400,000. There was no difference whatsoever, particularly not to my fucking pocket. There's a dog in Patrick's Day who got paid more than me, and I was the fucking writer and director. That's not a joke. Beautiful dog, too, the bastard, but anyway. But all that matters. It's what happens between two human beings in front of the lens of a camera. And when two human beings are open to something that is larger than their fear, larger than their ego, and they become conduits for something that is transcendent, that survives, and that's what impacts an audience. And that's what we should all be talking about and all trying to capture. So you often speak a lot of, especially in your acting classes, about the Aristotelian construct could you just tell us all about what is the Aristotelian construct and how you use it in your films? <laughs> the brief version. <laughs> Could you please bore the arse off the audience? All right, I, again, some of you know this, some of you don't. I'll try and keep it as quick as possible. But the reason it's so important is that we don't really understand structure. We're not taught structure. As writers, as actors, as directors, as producers, as cinematographers, we're not taught structure. In other countries, Germany, France, America, England, they teach structure. They teach the imperative power and benefit to the artist of structure. So the basic idea is that Aristotle was less interested in aesthetics and more obsessed with the mechanisms of what makes something work, what makes it not work, and why. So they wanted to study all the great plays of the day. And the greatest playwrights in the history of the world came from ancient Greek theater. So in studying them, they devised a very simple model. And that model creates the idea of 
what do you do to an audience to make them feel something that makes them transcend their own reality? So the example that we give is that a man walks into a whorehouse. What do you know about that man? Look at them all silent, pretending they've no idea. What do you know about that man? Right? Who cares? You want a woman's story? What makes you think there's a woman not involved in this story? And did you just presume his fucking gender? How dare you? A man walks into a whorehouse. What do you know? He's lonely, he's single, he's lonely. <laughs> There's more revealing about you, right? Huh? Okay, now look what you're doing. Look what your mind is doing. Look what your collective and individual brain is doing. It's a magical thing. I just said a man walks into a whorehouse and you crazy bastards are creating a whole reality for him. <laughs> it's a magical thing. It's a wonderful thing. Now, based on the presumed moral position, and I know you were only half joking, but rightly so half serious, the idea of a presumed moral position, we all have a presumed moral position. A man walks into a whorehouse. Now, it doesn't matter what you feel about prostitution or that man. It's great that you all feel different things. That's wonderful, particularly lonely mentioned twice. The idea of how we feel about that man is now ours. We own it individually, simply through a line. A man walks into a whorehouse, and that's called a setup. And in that setup, we establish a presumed moral position. But once an audience is set up, they're insatiable. They want more. A man walks into a whorehouse because he found out his daughter is working there. What happens now to our presumed moral position? Okay. Say again? Okay, a challenge. Now, but do you see the way your response is individual to you? It's visceral. It's now emotional. It's no longer intellectual. It's no longer gender-based. It's no longer political. It's an emotional response. Now what happens is in the setup, a man walks into a whorehouse, we establish a presumed moral position. But when we discover that he found out his daughter is working there, our presumed moral position is reversed. Our sense of moral superiority is reversed. Our confidence is reversed. We're now a little bit uncomfortable because what we thought we knew is reversed. Make sense? Now, within that, there's a pleasure, and the pleasure is in knowing that we're in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing. But audiences are insatiable. Audience wants more. They want a setup, they want a reversal, and they want a subversion. A man walks into a whorehouse because he found out his daughter is working there, and he's always wanted to fuck his daughter. Now, what happens? What happens to the room? What happens to the individuals? What happens to your moral certitude? What happens to your sense of self? What happens to your political position? Everything now is in flux. And this is just through three sentences. And those three sentences are set up reversal subversion. And the function and the power and the benefit to the actor and the writer and the director of set up reversal subversion is thousands of years old for a reason and incredible tools to be used to this day. And once you apply the basic idea of setup reversal subversion to any scene, from the fucking mastery of Shakespeare to the horseshit of Fair City, anything in between. Did you sense me because I said something wrong about Fair City? Actually, I don't mean to be disrespectful to Fair City, it's wonderful. But the idea of what we are willing to do within a given construct as actors. When actors understand and when directors understand and when writers understand the responsibility is to stimulate and provoke the audience into confronting their presumed moral position, we now have a conversation worth having. We now have a conversation about the work required to get to that place. That's a basic example. So let's fucking move on from Aristotle before you die of boredom. So. 
during the process of this weekend, we'll have people who've made over 100 short films, have made features, we'll have people who've never made a short film. This is their first time. They'll go through the process of getting on this stage, pitching, then they'll cast it, they'll shoot it, they'll edit it, and then they'll screen it here Sunday night, all of which is a very, very transformative experience. And one that you can bring a lot of momentum to after you leave Kino and after you try to do your own things. What advice would you give to any of the aspiring filmmakers to do after the weekend here in Kino to bring that momentum forward to something progressive? Again, you know, what fuck advice can I give you except have the courage to go into the unknown. Have the courage to be uncomfortable. And have the courage to look at the person in front of you and wonder what makes them uncomfortable. And by uncomfortable, I don't mean discomfort. I mean the thing that makes you vulnerable. And vulnerability is not a weakness, it's a strength. Have the courage to go into a place where you're about to discuss something that unnerves you, something that you would be hesitant to tell. And in those conversations, the consequence is that an audience member somewhere is going to go, fuck, it's not just me. I'm not alone. Lonely, lonely. I'm not the only person feeling this. Not as a compliment. I'm not the only person feeling this. And when an audience member feels that they're not the only person in the world who feels this, your job is done because your fucking job is to make other people feel less alone in the world. And if you're making work that makes people feel less alone in the world, that's worth getting out of bed for. That's worth making something for. That's worth living for. That's a really worthy aspiration. You've, in the past, described filmmaking as impossible at times. So simply, why do you still do it? Why do you still make films? Because I have fucking some kind of mental deficiency, obviously. Like everybody in this room. Look, you're all a bunch of fucking weirdos. Let's not pretend otherwise. If you weren't a bunch of fucking weirdos, you wouldn't be here on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> and that weirdo quality in you might be the best thing about you. People who make films are outsiders. And they're not making films to get inside. Because a lot of you here would be very easily accepted on the inside. But when you are inside, you feel uncomfortable. They're not your tribe. And it's not that you're dismissing anybody or judging anybody. But you know that among the misfits, that's where the fucking interesting things happen. Now, again, I've, I've taught in all the major uni universities in this country. So you talked about the Leaving Cert horseshit earlier. That's, that's an impediment to what? To nothing. I've also made films that allowed me to understand the world on a level that I never, ever would have been allowed to understand through any other process. I've met some of the greatest people of my life in this country and in other countries, directly as a consequence of filmmaking. I've been brought to countries all over the world, continents I never thought I would go to, because of the invention of a fiction that made somebody feel something to such a degree that they wanted to be a part of it. Is there anything more addictive? Is there anything more alchemical? And is there any reason for wanting to become part of a community? This, this thing here today, I think this keynote idea is wonderful because it's pragmatic. It's not about theory or abstraction. It's about fucking making something. And those are the only two categories left. You're either making something or you're not. The rest is all bullshit. The rest is all fucking wank. You're invited to the greatest orgy in the world and you're in the corner with your back to the orgy jerking off. What the fuck is that nonsense? We either have the courage to recognize that as a community of fucking weirdos. We have the power to make something happen in a dark room that makes people feel in a way they haven't felt in a long time. Move to tears, move to laughter, move to the yearning for love, move to political action. That's an astonishing power. And I don't mean power yielded the way governments yield power. I mean the humility, the fucking delicacy of the power to affect somebody in that way. I can't think of anything more addictive. So you recently screened your new film, feature film, The Kiss of Death in the Galway Film Flat. What was 
the whole experience like film in, in Nigeria. And as you've spoken about it with me before, and I think it's, it's an amazing story, what was that experience like compared to filming in your own native country? Well, in, in, in my own country, I've been cancelled. I've been fucking cast on the heap for questioning the fallacy of waking the feminists, which is a complete fallacy. And I'm sure there's women here who go, what the fuck is he talking about? But women and men and artists, both of which are, the fact that we are creating div div divisive language in terms of skin color, in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality, is deeply disturbing and damaging to the genuine, equitable, misfit reality of our community. But it suits people in power to keep us divided. Um, if you question that, you're thrown out. But in terms of Africa, I went to Africa to make a film. Probably the fucking dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. But the belief over there, and this is going to sound absurd, but they wanted me to revolutionize Nollywood, is the way they phrased it. And in, I don't know whether you know Nigerian cinema, but Nollywood is a certain type of film. It's hugely dramatic, hugely over the top, and not very technically effective. But they had this idea that I would somehow revolutionize Nollywood. And I said, where the fuck did you get this idea? And they said it was ordained by God. Now, that's as fucking absurd as it sounds, particularly for a fucking godless fucker like me. But when someone tells you that something is ordained by God, you have two choices. You either go, this is horseshit, or you go, this is interesting horseshit. And it's very hard to say no to somebody whose belief system is so strong that they believe it's predestined, preordained. So you arrive in, in, I don't know whether any of you have been to Nigeria, it's an amazing fucking place. There's 245 million people in Nigeria. And when you arrive at the airport, you feel like you meet every single one of those 245 million. They're fucking nuts, but nuts in the best way. Everyone is on the make, everyone is on the hustle, everyone is the central character in their own movie. And everybody wants something. And it's not that they want something because they want to scam you, it's that they want something because they have a hope. They believe in hope, despite unimaginable poverty, and despite the evident lack of hope, they believe in it. And then when you're on set, you have three men with fucking armed, three armed men with machine guns standing around you. But the least you give a fuck about is the three men with the machine guns, because you might have a 6.30 a.m. call, and nobody turns up until 3.30 p.m., and the fucking sun has gone down at 5 p.m. And the script is shit, and nobody knows what the fuck they're doing. And you go, okay, this is the circumstances of this film. How do we make this film? And it's back to that setup reversal subversion. It's back to a thematic question. It's back to alchemy. It's back to looking at a scenario and going, this is impossible. Making a movie is going to war against the impossible. But through going to war against the impossible, what do you discover? Not just the possible, but something you never even conceived of. The consequence of going to war against the impossible is something that you could never, ever prepare for. And again, the film has no right to exist. It screened in Galway and had a fucking crazy impact on people. And it's a film that, if I had the chance to make it all over again, despite the fear, and you're talking about real fear, despite the danger, real fucking danger, I'd do it all over again. Because it's back to that simple idea. How do you walk into an unknown world, turn that world upside down, and make it into something that exists beyond that world? Lovely. So guys, this is when we open the floor up to questions. So, who wants to have the first guess? So I'm gonna have to come over. Hello. Uh, Terry, I follow you on social media for a while and I've read a lot of your writing even on social media posts. And I did complete my leaving cert, but my English doesn't compare. You have a way with English, spelling, words, grammar, grammar, <laughs> grammar, commas, and full stops and all that. 
and you didn't complete the leading search. How did you excel with your writing abilities? <laughs> it's just a fucking late, late show. Uh, I, I was kicked out of home when I was 15. I got a girl pregnant, and my father threw everything I owned into a black plastic bag, hit me a punch in the stomach, and I collapsed on my knees, puked up blood, took the black plastic bag and walked in to town, having no idea where I was going. But the place that I went to was a library. And then I thumbed a lift to Dublin, and the place I used to hang around all the time. When you're homeless, you look for somewhere that opens early. And I used to go to the Alex Center Library. And then eventually I got a bed sit for 11 pounds a week. And when I got that bed sit, I remember picking up, uh, for 5p, picking up a copy of Dostoevsky's novel, Crime and Punishment. And the reason I wanted to read it is because I have a brother, a twin brother, so he was going through the school process. He was going to do his leaving cert, he went on to university, all that stuff. And I felt, with a massive chip on my shoulder, I felt completely excluded from that world. But I remember reading Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment. I don't know if everybody here has read it or if not. Yeah, I've read it. But it's... Good book. It's a book, thanks very much. Two fucking Westmeath men indeed. <laughs> but uh, but it, I, I had never read something before that stunned me on a level that felt like Dostoevsky, who was already dead for generations, had somehow saw my life. The central character is Raskolnikov. He kills his landlady because he believes it's justified and he will use the consequence of that for good. And I had a landlady, a little midget, crazy bitch, who was trying to fuck me. It was bizarre. And I could not believe that the manifestation of my life had been in that book. And since then, then I, when I was younger, I discovered Bukowski, but Bukowski spoke on a different level. But I, just, I ended up, I would forego food to buy a book, or I would go to the library and read all day. And the greatest educators in the world are the ones who've already done it in the same way as the greatest filmmakers in the world are the ones who've already done it, and they're giving us the gift, not of imitating them, but the gift of recognizing what's possible. So, it would be, and again, this is, this is presuming you're right. I just fucking, I don't know what, what I write, but I do know that the reading of great writers is the greatest education you can have. In the same way as filmmakers, we should be reading screenplays. Nobody reads screenplays. It's fascinating. People read novels all the time and reread novels. But how many people here have read a screenplay of their favorite film? It's really interesting. It's such a tiny minority. Like, it's your favorite film and you've never read the screenplay? And then sometimes if you read the screenplay of your favorite film, you're stunned by how different it is. And sometimes the screenplay is far superior to the film. And sometimes it's far inferior. But through reading other screenplays, Marco Rose, a good friend of mine. Marco Rose is probably the greatest writer of his generation. But Marco Rose obsessively reads screenplays, obsessively reads other stage plays, obsessively reads screenwriting books, script writing books, interviews. The, the greatest, we, we exist in a time which is amazing that we have access to podcasts now, some of which are three, four hours long. And those podcasts, the artists in those podcasts, give access to every single process of how their work unfolds. It's an amazing gift. So submerging yourself in the great works of the great artists is the best way to start to find your own voice. Does that make sense? <coughs> Hello. Um, so you spoke a lot about, like, kind of... Uh, critics and other people kind of coming at you and telling you that you can't particularly do something. And I was just wondering, because it's something I've heard uh, myself and other filmmakers speak about, how useful is spite as an emotion? Like if someone tells you you can't, where do you use that in approaching your work to say, actually, I can? It's a great question. And if somebody says, I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks, they're either lying or they're a psychopath. And I'm not being facetious. If you don't give a fuck what other people think, like, what's the point in doing what you're doing? Like, go to a bank, throw people out of their homes. Use that power that you have of not giving a fuck about other people to your financial advantage. But in terms of criticism, 
if you have, it's back to that idea, if you have the courage to go to the unknown place that makes you uncomfortable, you know that the thematic question you're asking, and by a thematic question, I mean something that you can't readily and easily answer, that the process of the work starts to reveal a series of answers. If you do that honestly, and if you do that transparently, you can't control the consequence of it, nor should you try, but you can know at, that at least you had the fucking courage to go to the unknown place and find those unknown answers. As opposed to, a lot of stuff now is committee created. A lot of people were told, you know, listen to your critics. There's a big difference between critiquing something and a critic. You and I can be friends, I can read something that you've written, and I can th say it's brilliant in this section, but there's problems with this section because it relates to, and we can have a conversation about structure. A critic, on the other hand, you know, a critic is a eunuch in a whorehouse. They know how it should be done, but they've never done it themselves. They haven't a fucking clue. So the idea of, and I think it was Behan who said that, but the idea of allowing a critic to define the nature of a film. Like recently in the Galba Film Fla, I saw a movie, King Frankie. Have you heard of King Frankie? Now Peter Coonan, P Peter Coonan is the lead actor. And for me, the jury has been in and out on Peter Coonan for quite some time. He's a lovely fella. I know him, he's a beautiful fella, but I, I didn't really understand how remarkable he could be. And he gives a performance in King Frankie that's one of the best things I've ever seen from any Irish actor. An astonishing piece of work. And the film is astonishing. And in any other context, that film would have won best first feature. And yet, not only did it not win, it's fucking ignored. So I don't, I don't understand the critical appraisal that leads to the, to the ignoring of that film and the elevation of other films. Nor, should it, nor do I want to understand it. I want to understand how the director and the actor and the writer and the cinematographer created such an extraordinary piece of cinema as King Frankie. And that's where our focus should be. Not on some fucking critic, dumb fuck cunt. Just in case there's any doubt how I feel about them, go ahead. I am the dumb fuck he was referring to. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so I'm the kind of person who likes to get myself into a situation where everybody says it's impossible. Then I do it and everybody feels like, oh wow, great. And I'm kind of proud of myself. So uh, at this point I'm trying to get myself to make a film, but independently and I was wondering what's the, what are the ways to make a big film, but independently, and like ha have an own crew and everything, but like it requires money. So at the moment I'm kind of stuck about uh, how independent filmmakers get money for bigger films. Well, like TV shows, for example. Say again? Uh, for films or TV shows. I, I know it sounds crazy at the moment, but I believe it's possible. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound crazy, but the problem is the fact that you have to ask the question means you're completely outside the system anyway. And despite the claims from those in power that they're, they want original voices and they want distinctive stories, they're lying cunts. They don't give a fuck. And I'm not saying that lightly. All they care about is protecting their job. And the way they protect their job is by creating derivative films and televisions or television shows that can be compared to other films and television shows. That's their job. So you look at, for example, RT, Kin. Kin was what they were looking for, which was effectively a different version of Love Hate. All they want to do is reproduce something that they know will be a hit among audiences. That's all they care about. Now again, I've, I've dealt with RT. And they're, they're, they're shysters, liars, frauds. But at the same time, they will go on a panel or they will go on television and they will talk with fucking joy about discovering new voices. Utter horseshit. It's a lie. But the, as I said, the fact that you're asking the question means you're outside the system. So I would use that to your advantage. Have you, it is, again, it's back to the idea of what's available. There's a lot of DVD extras. But if you ever watch Francis Ford Coppola directing Dracula, 
on the DVDs, I think it's on YouTube actually, but you have Gary Oldman, you have everybody, and you have Francis Ford Coppola, one of the greatest directors of all time, and he's filming everything on a small little phone. Not the phone, it's, the, it's a video camera. But he's filming everything on the video camera. And he's cutting it together. So each day, he films it on a video camera and he cuts it together, and that's the film that he wanted to make. And curiously enough, some of the stuff that he filmed on his small little video camera was far better than what ended up in the film. And he'll admit this himself. So your phone, and I, I know I keep on mentioning the phone, but your phone has the capacity to do something astonishing. And yet we don't use it in that way. Rather than asking permission from people to throw us scraps from the table, we should be cooking our own food. We should be opening our own restaurants. We should be joining our own community and making something so clear and defiant that these fuckers start coming off their table and taking notice of you. Because that's the only way they can control you. Now I know, again, there's a friend of mine just, just yesterday was working on a project for RT. And he was paid less money for series two than he was paid for series one. And series one was a huge hit. Now when you look at that, you look at the reality of that, that's the shit they're getting away with. They also have buyout clauses. I mentioned Christopher Nolan earlier, I still get checks over 20 years later for that piece of shit, not piece of shit, but that tiny little thing that I played. I have sold stuff to RT, and they broke the contract and kept on rescreening it despite never having paid for it. That's standard. But the greatest way to defy that system is to make something so clear that that system comes looking for you. And then you can tell them to go fuck themselves. <coughs> How are you, Terry? Um, my question was in relation to something you said quite early on. Um, it's about screenwriting, and um, basically it's about theme. And I'm wondering, do you approach a project or a script with theme first and then get into plot, or do you do it the other way around, and you have your story, get into the plot, and then um, you know allow the theme to evolve, which I think you kind of alluded to earlier? Well, it's, it's a good question because there's, not only is there no right or wrong way, all you're looking for is some fucking way. But the benefit of theme is that it gives you structure. So we talk about it all the time, but rather than being blind and deaf and dumb in this fucking big unknown dark space of the imagination, theme is like somebody lights a candle. Plot is like someone lights a candle down there. Now between this candle and that candle, you've no idea how you're gonna get there, but at least you're no longer in the fucking dark. And if you choose to change it, or if you choose to pick that candle up and keep on walking down, and it changes on the way, that's all good. But the problem is that a lot of writers, they, they create things and they get excited by the feeling of creation. Getting excited by the feeling of creation is again masturbation. Nobody's gonna get pregnant, but you're looking to get somebody pregnant. You're looking to make something happen that a life beyond you starts to take over. And that incredible feeling when characters start telling you who the fuck they are, rather than you telling them who they are. That feeling is incredible, but it usually comes from structure. Now again, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in structure because the example we always give is a, a chair. If you look at a chair, a chair is a masterpiece of structure because, and we do this in the class, but are you aware that you're sitting on chairs? You're not. You weren't aware of it until I asked you. And the reason you're not aware of it is because the chair is such a masterpiece of structure that it gives you security, it gives you comfort, and it gives you the confidence to know that everything is going to be fine. Now, when you have structure, that's what it does for an audience. An audience is willing to go to an unknown place if they know that they're in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing. But what happens to a chair if one leg is one centimeter shorter than the other three legs? What happens to your balance? What happens to your sense of self? What happens when one leg is gone? What happens to that chair? It falls, it's gone. So structure comes from theme, theme comes from structure. And the best thing from my experience is that to make you feel less 
fucked as you enter that unknown world. Structure is your friend, is your support, is your ally, but it is also malleable and willing to support you even if you change it. Make sense? It also, just the last thing is that it also allows you to go, what is the functionary purpose of this scene? Why are these characters doing these things? I'm excited by this scene, but am I excited for the wrong reasons? When they talk about killing your darlings, this is what they're talking about. The scene has got to have function and form. It has got to have a reason for existence. It has got to push everything forward that becomes inexorably, impossibly difficult to achieve. And if your scene is not at the very least performing that function, what's its purpose? If we don't know more about the characters at the end of the scene than we did at the beginning, what's its purpose? If we're not asking questions about the character at the end of the scene that we weren't asking at the beginning of the scene, what's its fucking purpose? So clever dialogue, that's not a scene. Now, you can create a brilliant scene and still have clever dialogue in it. But the audience, remember, 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 this is about the audience, it's not about you. If you're writing something that's about you, go back to jerking off. If you're writing something that's about an audience, now you're entering the orgy. Did that answer your question? I was just wondering um, if you've heard or know what the impact of your Nigerian film has been in Nigeria, given the situation that was explored. Uh, uh, again, the, the producer lost his mind a little bit. He's a good guy, but sometimes when people make films, they lose their minds. And I don't know what's happening with the film there. I know that a couple of people at the screening who are from Kanu, Kanu is a northern region of Nigeria, mostly Muslim culture, some fundamentalism. And there were two women there, and they said that if this screens in Kanu, there will be a riot. And in Kanu, when there is a riot, there will be people killed. And that's the last thing you want. I've no interest in that provocation. I've no interest in facilitating anything like that. But at the same time, there was other people there <coughs> who said that for them it was the most exciting Nigerian film they had ever seen. So one of the things that we learn about film, and I'm learning this more every fucking day, is that if you create a space that does not propagandize what it's doing, which is not telling you what to feel, people can fill that empty space with whatever they fucking choose. And some people will fill it with magnanimous ideas, and some people will fill it with malicious ideas. And you can't control either, but you gotta make sure that you're not trying to create malicious ideas. Make sense? Other than a horn, what gets you up in the morning? No, that's actually not my, that's not my, that's not my question. Your horn gets me up every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Your dick is bigger than mine. Well, go on, go hey. My real name is Michael. Actually, that's when you say that. No, you've had a colorful career and along the way you have been canceled and we've talked about that and I've even talked to you and said to you, you're marmite to people sometimes, you know? Um, and you're not bulletproof. And I just wondered, with such a cancel culture that we weren't, you know, exposed to when we were younger, how have you pulled yourself out of that now? Again, it's, it's interesting because when you roll the dice on a film, and again, I, I don't want to sound like a fucking pretentious prick here. Can you all hear me, by the way? My voice is gone here, but... I, I, for me, it's, 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 it's very arrogant of me to sit up on this elevated platform as if somehow I'm superior to it's fucking nonsense. I'm as lost and as much of a misfit as any one of you. And every time you make a new film, you know nothing. It doesn't matter what preceded it. It doesn't matter how many fucking awards you have. I think, I won, I think it was 29 awards I won. What the fuck does that even mean? It's nonsense. Until... I was contacted by a collector, and he offered me a fuckload of money to buy all those awards, and suddenly I saw their value. <laughs> but in terms of cancel culture, the consequence of making films is, and I'm sure you all know this, not just are we misfits, not just are we outsiders, but as each year passes, 
we get further and further away from being part of normal society. We can't get a mortgage. We can barely pay our fucking rent if we have a place to rent. We're never going to get a proper job. We don't understand any more about the world than we did previously. We are even more at odds with the state of the world than we ever were. And we sacrifice things. The consequence of making films is that you're going to lose things. You're going to lose friendships. You're going to lose lovers. You're going to lose relationships. My relationship is over because of making a film in Africa. And that's a huge consequence. And again, it's not that you sacrifice one or play one off against the other, but because of the decisions you make to go to those unknown places, particularly as you start to get older, people become less and less patient with you because they're going, what the fuck is this all about? When, when are you going to get famous? When are you going to make money? When are you going to... And you go, but it was never about that. And then you realize for them, for them it was. They tolerated so much because they thought there was a game plan. Until you reveal, much to their fucking horror, that not only is there no game plan, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Now, the idea of cancellation, I find cancel culture really, really strange. Because not only did I not do anything, not only was I never accused of do doing anything, I was cancelled for asking the wrong questions. Literally for asking the wrong questions. And I give, I'm, I'm obsessed with evidence-based reality. So I give long lists of evidence-based facts to verify the dangers of what they were implementing. And remember, this is 10 years ago. And look at the consequence of it now. We're existing in a realm where not only is there no meritocracy, but we're patronizing people because of their skin color, their gender, their sexuality. As if somehow they're incapable of creating work themselves. As if somehow their wonderful stories need to be fucking bolstered by cunts who don't give a fuck about any of us. So th that, that cancellation comes as a consequence of having, having, no matter what, having to find the truth of something. So I can live with that. If it was for something else, it'd be different. But it's not. And the problem with cancel culture is that it's a weaponized philosophy that allows the weakest of us to control the strongest of us through silence. And we look at, we were discussing it earlier, Regardless of how you feel about COVID, look at the response of artists during COVID. What did we do? In our country in particular, we did nothing. We allowed our nation to be shut down. We acquiesced to our government. Where were the anarchists? Where were the rebels? Where were the fucking warriors? I, I was asked to give a speech and I said no more speeches. And eventually I realized that I, the reason I wasn't able to do the speech is because I was terrified. And the moment I realized I was a coward, I finally agreed to make the speech. The speech was on World Freedom Day. It was outside government buildings. There was tens of thousands of people there, families, extraordinarily beautiful people, who were questioning the narrative that was being imposed by the government, which now subsequently has proven to be total horseshit. The consequence of that is that John McGuire, who was the lead, who is the lead critic in the Sunday Business Post, said that all future funding should be pulled from all future projects of mine. And instantly, it was agreed upon. And instantly, he was hailed as a hero. And the state pulled all funding from any future projects of mine. That's cancellation on a level that's really disturbing. Because the speech that I was making was about the necessity of freedom. And when artists, and I wouldn't put myself much in the category of artists, but it's a, it's a word we need to relearn and retake. But when artists don't question their government, and when critics are called heroes for shitting all over the artists who question the government, cancel culture becomes something much more disturbing. Make sense? This is all fucking fine and happy stuff, isn't it? I'm back there. <laughs> Hey, um, yeah, are there like um, any sort of storytelling or things coming out now that inspires you? Or if not, like, are there stuff you'd like to see today or on screen or whatever, really? Again, it's a good question. But 
<coughs> excuse me, I'm not cynical about what's being made. There are some remarkable th things being made, and the example I gave was King Frankie. And I, I'm really, really fascinated to see what happens with that film, because I think it's the most electrifying movie I've seen in a long, long time. And yet, there's not a whisper about it. So it worries me, because it was made independently, it was independently financed, and when something is independently financed, it's not in the interest of Screen Ireland to push that film. So very often, a film that's really beautifully executed can vanish because the machinations of those in power who are going to benefit financially from promoting their own project, as opposed to the claim of cultural diversity and cultural whatever, they will bury that film if it's going to be opening on a weekend where one of their projects is opening. And that's basic business. I don't even fucking, I don't even blame them for it. But that's the, that's the most exciting thing I've seen in a long time. Outside that, uh, again, short films. Interesting, you have so many people here making short films. And the fact that you're making short films over the period of a weekend. There are things that will happen over the next 12, 14, 16 hours that if captured properly, will be fucking visceral and magical and alchemical. And despite everything, that's the shit that I return to again and again. And I don't care if it's in... Actually, I, 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 I went to see... Um, what's it called? Wolverine and Deadpool. I laughed my bollocks off. I thought it was one of the most wonderfully anarchic films I've seen in years. And it's already hit nearly a billion and a half dollars. So there's really a, a huge appetite out there for subversion. But that's, a, that's an anomaly, I know that. But the work that can be done here, the, the work that you can capture over the coming several hours can be electrifying in a way that makes us remember why we're doing what we're doing. It doesn't have to be Oscars. It can be in this fucking room. Make sense? Anyone else? Hi, how are you doing? Um, delighted to hear the great good words about King Frankie because I did a tiny, tiny little part in it. <laughs> but I believe it has been taken up by wildcard distributors and they're planning an autumn release in the, in the theatres, but I don't know, I haven't heard any dates for that. So hopefully it will get a general release and do well. But I haven't seen it myself because unfortunately I've been away for the Galway Film Fly and the Diff uh, Festival, so I've missed it. You said you're a tiny part of it, what does that mean? Um, I, I played a very, very small role in the film. I was the, oh, wow. I was the priest at the funeral. You'll be, you'll be really fucking proud of it. Really proud of it. It's an extraordinary film. Yeah. Well, so I'd love to see it. <laughs> haven't yet. But anyway, my question really was to do, with, just to say, have you got any advice for people um, on the whole issue of rejection? Because I'm, I'm a latecomer to this game. I only started this after retirement about two years ago, despite my advanced years. But I'm just fascinated by an industry wh which has em embedded into it an extraordinary repetitive rejection of your efforts, whether it be auditions or whatever, or just not getting jobs. Um, and I, I think it can be soul destroying, but yet people keep plugging away. And I just, I think people to succeed in this business have got to have extraordinary resilience. I'm so just wondering, it sounds like you've had a fair bit of this in your time. Have you any advice to offer on that? How dare you? I've never been rejected. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because like, there are people far fucking smarter than me who talk about this all the time. And uh, I think it was Michael Keaton, the actor Michael Keaton. He had a, he, it's, check it, it's on YouTube or whatever. But he talks about the idea of turning every audition or interview. I think audition is a, is a kind of a, a dodgy word. Interview. If it's an interview, it becomes instantly a conversation. But he talks about it being the opportunity to play. I'm paraphrasing it, but the opportunity to go, fuck, by this time tomorrow, I gotta really deliver this. So that when you walk into the room, you're walking in to present a gift. Now, if I walk in and I give you a dinner that I've cooked for you, and then you don't like the dinner, it doesn't mean I'm a shit cook. It means you're a fucking ungrateful cunt. <laughs> so. Once you get into that idea and that recognition, now you're talking about did you come to this game late? So the rejection, and again, you came from the real world. 
into this game. There are people here who go, they've been rejected all their fucking lives. And that's what I'm talking about, the weirdos and the oddballs. It's not that you embrace rejection. It's that you recognize, I've been, I've been the other side of the camera for auditions. And every single actor who walks in the fucking room, I want to cast. Every one of them. I want to cast before they do anything. It breaks my heart to see them coming in. But then they do the work. And you go, I know why I'm not casting you. Because you're a lazy bastard. You didn't do the fucking basic preparation. You're standing there with the fucking script in your hand, shaking. I love you. <laughs> Get the fuck out of the room, you lazy bastard. You don't deserve to be cast. And you're not being rejected because you don't have talent. You're being rejected because you're a lazy motherfucker who didn't do the basic preparation. And that's amazing that straight away you start to understand the difference between an actor who understands that an audition or an interview is a finished piece of work. So if a director is watching, and a producer and a writer is watching an actor, what they'll do is, what, what do you think a director is looking for from an actor? What do you think a producer is looking for from an actor? What do you think a casting agent is looking for from an actor? Enhance, how? Authentic to the script. Most producers are illiterate fucks. Most casting directors don't give a shit anyway, even if they could read. And most directors are shitting themselves they're going to be fired. So what they want is somebody to make them look good. A casting director wants to say, I discovered him. What's your name? Cahill. What? Connell. Connor. Connor. Fucking speak up, Connor. Get out of the room. <laughs> no, but what they want to say is, I discovered Connor. He came late in life, but I discovered him. The producer wants to go, fuck, Connor's an unknown, but my God, he's good. And what the director wants is somebody who's going to make the whole process exciting. An actor who walks in and goes, again, we've discussed this in the class, but if you've ever sat on the other side of a camera for an audition process, it's always the same process. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, people are having their double espressos, they're all fucking hot and horny. They can't wait. By 10 o'clock, they want to put a gun in their mouth and pull the fucking trigger. Because every stupid cunt is coming in doing the same thing. Again, I love you. You go, what are you doing? You had the script all fucking night? You think that it, turning up not knowing the basic dialogue. If someone turns up not knowing the basic dialogue, what does that tell the director? Not just that they're terrible. They don't care. They're disrespectful. They're, they're in, it's an insult to the writer. It's an insult to the process of how films are made. It also means they haven't studied the script. And because the dialogue is not the script. Remember this, the dialogue is not the script. The dialogue is something that somebody uses to try and get what they want. That's all it is. But the script means that the structure and form of the scene, they haven't a clue about that. They haven't even done the most basic thing. And again, imagine I cooked you dinner. Instead of cooking you dinner, I put a fucking bag of uncooked rice and curry powder and a slab of fucking meat on a plate and say, here's your fucking dinner. That's what they're doing. Whereas when a director watches an actor who comes in and clearly shows a comprehension of form and structure and the reason for the existence of the scene, and then understands setup, reversal, subversion, and then understands how to use a prop, and then understands how to take that scene into a place that makes the fucking director and the writer feel like they've never seen the scene before. What do you think happens then? That's the power of the actor. That's the alchemy of the actor. So rejection, if you get rejected after doing all the necessary preparation and you really fucking nail the scene, then it's out of your hands. Very often actors are cast for reasons that are nothing to do with their talent. It's to do with how they compare with somebody else or what their fucking credits is in IMDB or whatever nonsense it is. But a, a casting director will remember the day you came in this guy who's late to the game called Connor, who did the fucking scene in a way that was incredible. And they will look for you to come back because they want to be the person who discovered you. And every time you're called into a room to do an audition, the rejection is not the issue. 
The issue is, what is the function and form of the scene, and how can you fucking dance in a way that changes that room and makes everybody go, fuck, this guy is the real deal. That's how to deal with rejection. Make sense? Hi. Um, you've mentioned before that sometimes to go into the unknown and explore the whole like filmmaking world, um, you have to make choices uh, where you could potentially end up alone or make some difficult choices. So of course, like you had such a career that of course they were worth it. But is there anything you reject? Uh, um, you like um, sorry, um, regret? Sorry, yeah. Is there anything you regret with those choices? Regrets. Again, it's, it's, for me, it's always funny when I hear people like talking about career. I've had no fucking career. I've made four fucking movies and have been cancelled. That's some career. In terms of in terms of regret, if I have any regrets, it was it would be I regret not being more courageous. I regret not going all the way with the actor. That that would be the only regret. I regret I regret when an actor comes on stage. By st stage, I mean a sound stage or a set or whatever you call it. And not being willing to go into an even more unknown place with them. Actors' instincts are amazing. Actors, actors are the most generous society you'll ever meet. They're so fucking generous that they'll keep on trying to help the audience by giving them hints, and nudges, and winks. Whereas once an actor learns how to get over that, an actor walking into an unknown place can be stunned by what happens to their physiological self, their emotional, intellectual self, their history. When an actor is at their most vulnerable, in the best sense of the term, something alchemical happens in front of the lens of the camera. And the best thing you can do as a director is step the fuck back and just bask in the gift that the gods are giving you. That's the power of an actor. And when you have two actors in front of the lens of a camera, that's all that matters to an audience. You watch a, a major car chase. Again, I mentioned Wolverine earlier. The most boring parts of the film are these big car chases. But the parts where the audience is cracked up laughing or actually fucking a few times swallowed hard emotionally are the little two-handers where two human beings go to a place that makes us uncomfortable but compelled to watch because we feel less alone. I regret, if I have any regrets, I regret not doing more of that. Do you regret coming here? I regret that fucking haircut. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Anyway, uh, this is the last call for questions. So does anyone, any final questions? So one, two, three, right, last three. You, you'd fucking die for this hair, mate, I'm telling you. Hi. Uh, Thank you for a great session. Uh, I'm just starting to be a new writer now. I just want to know the writer part of you. Like, how do you get past the writer block? Or when do you know that, you know, OK, this is a fucking scene. Now I'm going to scene two. Like, how do you develop that part particularly? Sorry, it's, it's the speakers. Yeah. OK. Uh, so like, I'm, I'm just starting to be a writer now. So how do you go from the writer's block? I have an idea, but I'm not able to develop it. So. How do you go beyond from scene one to scene two? And when do you know that you know, this is scene one is done? He's asking about writer's block. Do you know what writer's block is? Writing. It's an absurd introduction of a word. You don't need the word block. Writing is constantly being blocked. I have a deadline for a screenplay commission that I have to have in by the 26th of the month. I was up at 6 a.m. this morning having a fucking nervous breakdown, trying to address the madness of the time that's left and the impossible task ahead. And then you sit down and you type in a word. And you type in another word that becomes a sentence. And that sentence becomes a paragraph, paragraph becomes a page. Writing is being blocked. If you understand that from the outset, you realize, okay, this way, if you were going to the gym, and you went to the gym, and you lifted weights that are too heavy, you'll tear a muscle. You won't eat proper food, so you'll be exhausted. What the fuck is going on here? 
You won't eat proper food, so you'll be exhausted. You won't allow yourself to do the necessary preparation required to prepare the muscles. Writing is the same way. Being blocked is inevitable. Writing is overcoming the block every day. If you allow a block to stop you, you're the fucking pussy. You're the coward, not the block. The block is not stopping you. You not taking action is what's stopping you. We talked about this before in relation to actors. Actors should know at least 50 monologues. 50. And maybe 40 scenes. Actors every day should be uploading their material to YouTube. Classical monologues, modern monologues, monologues they've written themselves. And it makes no sense to me that they don't do it. It's an amazing opportunity for you to sit down in front of the lens of your own camera and create extraordinary opportunities for people to see your work. And yet actors come into a room and you go, okay, that's really interesting, read. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have anything else that we can have a look at? And they look fucking stupefied. And then you go, okay, well, do you, do you have any comedy? Uh, do you have any drama? Do you have any tragedy? And suddenly you go, my God, you call yourself an actor and you haven't done the basic fucking things like learning monologues. Because once you learn a monologue, and again, it's not dialogue. Monologue is not dialogue. It is how you construct the scene. If you have an actor who walks in and you go, can we have a look at something else? And they go, which genre do you want? Now you get excited. You go, can we try comedy? Then they do comedy and you laugh your ass off. And already you want to work with them. Then you go, okay, can you do drama? And they go, okay, and they do drama. And you're fucking crying. Now you want to marry them. You want to take them home and have fucking kids with them, regardless of the gender. So the same applies to writing. Writing is about having the fucking physical discipline. No matter how you feel, no matter what you're thinking, no matter how much you're crushed by self-doubt, having the courage to hit that fucking stone wall with your head and fucking start to write with the blood every day, no matter what. And every writer should write for at least three hours every day. Every fucking day. And every actor should be recording a monologue for at least one hour every fucking day. And if you start to do that, just like in the gym, the muscles start to become strong. They'll resist initially, but then they'll start to become strong. And then you'd be so busy writing, you'd have forgotten the meaning of the word block. That's your question. you specifically look for with regards to um, show reels and uh, that this could apply to actors, it could apply to editors, etc. And whenever you were working inside the system, did you find that director show reels were in any way helpful uh, or not um, in promoting yourself? Thank you. It's a great question, but I, it's a great question, but I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I never watch somebody's past work. I'm much more interested in the person sitting across from me. So even in, in the job in Africa, particularly in the job in Africa, I, we had some very, very experienced people and people with no experience whatsoever. But I was asked to interview for all the heads of department. So we're in this fancy hotel and all these people are queuing for, to become the heads of the department. My only response is to go, who is this human being sitting in front of me? So I would say to them, okay, I want you to have the courage to step up and suggest, not to be limited, not to be waiting for me to give you the authority, have the fucking courage to step up and do something that raises the game for everybody. And I watch their eyes when I say that to them. And some people are terrified by that responsibility. And others get alive. So all I can respond to is instinctively. And for the most part, I've been very lucky. I think in general, like we have this idea of actors being prima donnas. That's a total fucking fallacy. 99.9% .9 of actors are not just prima donnas, they're the most generous people you'll ever meet. And they desperately want to get it right. They desperately want to fucking make it f go on fire. And if you tap into that and you have the fucking courtesy and the decency and the curiosity to try and bring that out in them, across all levels, every HOD, from actors to fucking everything else, then the set becomes an exciting place to become a part of. People become excited. And the greatest compliment, are, um, like, they talk about crew. They talk about cast and crew, like they're two separate organizations. 
And it's in the interest of financiers and producers to keep them separate, because together they become a really powerful force. But the greatest thing that a crew wants is for them to stop what they're doing and to watch what's happening. And a crew will have a greater eye about what's happening than most of the rest of the people on the set, including the actors. Because those other actors are too busy caught up in their own fear and their own doubt and their own courage. Whereas the crew is waiting for that moment where they stop and they go, fuck, this is the moment we were waiting for. This is the reason we make films. And that can only come from human beings, regardless of their experience. You'll see that some of the most experienced people in Irish film, or not just Ireland, but other places, are some of the fucking kindest, warmest, most curious people you'll ever meet. And that curiosity in them is what keeps everything going. Make sense? Um, you spoke about the unjust cancel culture and I suppose there's a higher elite who kind of tend to repeat the same films and stay in a little safety net. And you also spoke about Africa and hope. So I was wondering, do you see hope in the industry changing in the future? And if you see hope in the industry changing in the future, what is your opinion that us as individuals can do to change that? Yeah, well, the hope is in the room. Again, you're all the outsiders. This is not a Screen Ireland event. And I've spoken at Screen Ireland events. Nobody's going to pay for your fucking bar bill at the end of this. But at the Screen Ireland events, they fucking do. Nobody in Screen Ireland is the first to go home because they can't pay their fucking mortgage or their rent. They're the last to go home because their fucking card is paying for the whole lot. In terms of change, cultural change, this is the cultural change. And again, I, I know you're only half joking, but stop defining yourself by your fucking gender. Start defining yourself by your talent. Stop defining yourself by your fucking skin color. Stop defining yourself by your sexuality. What the fuck does anybody's sexuality have to do with anything? I don't care who you're fucking and sucking in the privacy of your own fucking house, or toilet, or wherever the fuck. Sometimes I want to be invited. It's got nothing to, <laughs> it's got nothing to do with fucking film. Skin color has nothing to do with film. Again, it's, for me, it's always interesting that we have this notion now when we talk about diversity that it relates just to people with brown colored skin, black as they call them, whatever the fuck that means. Black and white. When were we ever black and white? But what about the fucking Chinese who've been in this culture for generations? Where's their representation? So it's already hi a hypocritical lie. The only way to change the culture is to create something that allows the truth to come out. And again, I, I, it's interesting you talk about social media, and one of the remarkable things, you know, there's a lot of bad things about social media, but there's also a lot of wonderful things. And one of the things is that you can get to know somebody without really knowing them. So I know more about you than makes sense, because I've seen the courage of several of your posts. Now that courage, that courage is something that I know you will be fucking tentative when you're typing it in, because you're exposed, you're nervous. But if we talk about cultural change, like the most effective cultural change in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, those, those absurd scams. Somebody, uh, there's a gentleman there who asked the question earlier, the gentleman in the hat. Yeah, what skin color are you? No, but, but great answer, great fucking answer. Because I didn't see your skin color. I don't give a fuck what your skin color is, but I do care about your talent. And the way that for that to change is that when his talent becomes so irrefutable, we become so excited to be a part of it. When your talent becomes so irrefutable, we become so excited to be a part of it. Writing original, raw, painful, vulnerable material and making it is the fucking revolution. And that revolution has been the revolution since the fucking 40s. It hasn't changed. But for some reason, we sit cap in hand waiting for authorization from Screen Ireland a fucking absurdly ideologically captured organization that is paid for by the government? Do you really think the government is going to fund an organization that's going to question that government? These bunch of fucking lackeys acquiescing to every single dictum from a government for a paltry 26 million a year. The other day it was announced, Michal Martin announced that because of the success of the Olympics, an extra 400 million was going to be given to sports in Ireland. Killian Murphy just won the fucking Oscar. 
Where the fuck is our 400 million? But the difference is, our 400 million, nobody wants to fund anarchic voices. Nobody wants to fund rebel voices. No government organization is going to fund a voice that questions them. So step outside that system. This lady was going to ask something. Did you put up your hand, no? Yeah? No? Someone was saying hi. Hi. Well, um, you can tell me to feck off, but you were talking... Tell you to fuck off, not feck off, but go ahead. Well, do you know, I'm trying to integrate. I'm not Irish-born, so... Um, you were talking about the notion of, like, bravery with your actors and crews and your choices. What do you regret being afraid of? Like, what stopped you? What, what was it? Because whether you were cancelled and you had nothing to lose, or whether you were at the high and you had all kinds of fake or real, I don't know, I know shit about this, support. So what, what is it? What should we watch out for in terms of like thresholds and fear? Because we don't have much to lose either. Like, <laughs> look at us. And, and Kino made that happen. But like, otherwise we're like, kind of lost, so what, what is it that blocked? It's a fascinating question. The, in terms of the fear, the fear was not being able to feed my kids and pay my mortgage. And that's a fear that most of us have on some level or other. I know several people don't have kids and don't have a mortgage, but the fundamental idea of putting food on your table or paying rent. And one of the things that's heartbreaking about the kind of thing that we do is that we give over our lives every day for free to a belief in something that is so intangible, the likelihood of any financial return is almost zero. That's the reality, but that tells us straight away that we're not doing it for money. However, when you can't afford to pay your fucking bills and feed your kids and pay your mortgage, your family starts looking at you like you're a cunt. And it's very hard to say that's not true. It's very hard to say, okay, I don't know where the money's coming from. And I've been well paid. I've been, I've been paid a lot of money for writing in, in terms of my value system. Again, like I said, I went from being homeless. So I, when somebody gives me 25 grand to write something, that to me is a fuck load of money. And that's not Screen Ireland, by the way. Screen Ireland gives 12 to 14,000. And 12 to 14,000 spread over a year is how much? That's a grand a month. How much is your mortgage? How much is your rent? Your rent is 1800 a month. So Screen Ireland, which is funded by the Irish fucking taxpayer, is giving you less than half your fucking rent. And you're scrambling desperately to be selected by them? And they have readers who are reading your stuff who secretly resent the shit out of you because you even finished the screenplay? And they never did? Why are you even participating in that culture? So one of the regrets I would have is allowing that culture to define too much of my choices. After, it was a film called Patrick's Day that I made, and it was supposedly a big hit and all that kind of stuff. And immediately afterwards, Screen Ireland were going to fund my next film. And it was a screenplay called The Dance Hall Bitch, and it was a, set in a jail. And this is, again, 12 years ago, and it's about the reality of what men are capable of doing to construct the idea of what they want a woman to be. Look what's happening 12 years later now. But the film had been given the go-ahead. We were even asked to ask for 960 grand. And then I was told by somebody inside the room, who I'll have the courtesy not to name, but everything was going great. And then some woman in the room, and this was the beginning of woke culture, said, is it not a little bit misogynistic? And the whole fucking room froze in panic. Now, this is a film about misogyny. But even the question was enough to paralyze us in fear. And I think that these questions that are being presented by people are not questions that are looking for an answer. They are questions to create control. And I wish I had acquiesced a little bit less to that fucking control. Make sense?
just to go off what you ended with there, you spoke about creating and asking questions that create uncomfortable situations and inspire, and yet have this uh, ideology that that question posed in particular was from a place of control. So where in your mind do you draw that line of uncomfortableness to kind of more like a palatability towards wider audiences? Well, again, it's the intention behind the question. Like we exist in a realm now where the word misogyny, there's, there's words that have become such a part of our culture in the last five to 10 years that beggars belief. Misogyny, gaslighting, nobody, narcissism, yes. And we all know the buzz phrases, but where do those phrases come from? And how have they become such an endemic part of our culture? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. What is the agenda behind these questions? If the intention behind these questions is noble, then the, the uncomfortable conversations can bear incredible fruit, can be beautiful to be a part of. Like for example, uh, Waking the Feminists. Waking the Feminists came as a consequence of the 100 year anniversary of 1916. It was 2016 in the Abbey Theater. Fieg McAneil was the artistic director of the Abbey Theater and he announced the program for the 100 year anniversary. Of all the plays that were put on, there was one play by a woman. And somebody asked, why is there only one play by a woman when women were such a major part of 1916? Now that fucking question is not just entirely justified, it was a necessary question. And the consequence of it is that they had a big open day and all these women took to the stage, many of whom were there for self-promotion, not to answer that question. And it created supposedly a seismic shift in the culture. And then they moved on. Film Ireland, the, the president of Film Ireland at the time, it became her legacy piece. And even though nobody in Screen Ireland ever questioned the idea of gender, and you know why nobody in Screen Ireland questioned gender? Because 95% of the staff were female. 95 fucking percent were female. So who was stopping female filmmakers? Men, men reading a script going, geez, that's a brilliant script. It's a pity it's written by a woman and they throw it in the bin. It was bullshit, it was a lie. But the lie has now become a fact. And that fact is driven by an ideology that is so divisive that it actually reduces women it makes women something that need to be helped because they're semi-fucking retarded by their gender. And it's a lie, it's a total fucking lie. So when we look at Screen Ireland and we look at their, their reasons for their political positions, you gotta ask, what is the nature of the question being asked and what is the intention behind it? The same question being asked in the Abbey Theatre was entirely justified and was magnificent. That question stolen by Screen Ireland to promote an ideology that was divisive? It's the same question, but the intent is entirely different, and the consequence is profoundly different. Make sense? I just, I find it quite interesting, all of the, the, the thought behind, like, I do believe, to some extent, it's a great way to think, and it's a great ideology to have that this gender bias doesn't exist, but I personally, in my own trying to get work, or do work, have found it, and I have been in talks with other women who have also experienced similar, similar situations. I, I, I was told a story of someone who worked in a management position and there was one man on their team and whenever they'd meet with others, it was the man's hand that was shaken first. So I do believe to some level there is an unconsciousness bias and not saying it's coming from everywhere, but I do believe we can't ignore the fact that this still exists to some level. It'd be great if it didn't, but okay, it does. Well, uh, Okay, just, just for a second, because I, I hope this is interesting to people. On the year that they announced in Screen Ireland that they were gonna incorporate Waking the Feminists, the three best films of the year were made by women. Deirdre Walsh, or sorry, Dervla Walsh, Ashley Walsh had made two masterpieces. And the woman who edited Patrick's Day, Ema Reynolds. Those th were the three biggest films of the year, the three most successful films of the year, and the three best films of the year. And Screen Ireland chose to completely ignore and erase those three women from history, the history that was happening in front of them. 
Now, in terms of unconscious bias, that's probably the biggest scam of all. Because unconscious bias is impossible to prove. Why do you hate men? I never said I did. Don't fucking lie to me. Why do you hate men? I don't. That's you do, an absurd you clearly, thing. You to clearly assume. hate men. Clearly. And, if, and the fact that your unconscious bias refuses to allow you to see that is the problem. I don't hate men. Please get out. But that's the shit that they're pulling. That's the scam they're pulling. You can't prove unconscious bias, which is what makes it so attractive. The second thing is that in terms of, and, I, and I'm asking this with respect. Obviously, I was joking with the last question. Do you write, direct, act? What do you do? I'm a spark and a DOP, so. A spark and a DOP, OK. As a spark and a DOP, when was the last time you sought out a script? Pardon? When was the last time you sought out a script, a screenplay? Um, I, it, currently, in, in a smaller way, I'm working with people to create a script over the last okay. maybe a month, a couple of weeks Great. ago. Great, okay. Great, well fucking done. When was the last time you decided you were going to produce something and maybe direct something? Um, I've kind of shied away from that area. Okay. Did you shy away that because men are such fucking scumbags? No. No, so why did you shy away from it? Because it's not my, it's not my, I guess, like comfortable space to okay. exist. Okay, well done. It's not your comfortable space. Is that because of men? No, but I never in implied that it was. You just did. You said there's unconscious bias everywhere and that men are the first to have their hands shaken. I'll give you an example. I've been teaching for, Jesus, I've been teaching for, for 30 years, okay? And I've been teaching my own class for, I think, 20 years. And again, I, I mean this with total respect. I'm just talking about evidence-based. As some of the people here have done my class, at the end of every class, I talk about the reality of the people in the room being capable of creating their own films. If they threw in 100 euros each into a pot, they're capable of making a film. And again, as Liam said, the example given was Charlie Casanova, which was made for less than 1,000 euros, and ends up being picked up by Studio Canal for UK and Irish cinemas. So it's a pragmatic reality. It's not a, a fantasy. And again, I mean this with total respect. Of the hundreds of students over the course of those 20 years, I think 19 of them have made films, made feature films, using that model. How many of those were women? You know the answer already. I don't know. You fucking do. <laughs> Not one of them was a woman. Now, in that room, and again, I'm sure the people in this, class who, in this room who've done the class will attest that not only is there equality, I fucking push everybody just as hard. And I don't give a fuck about your gender or your skin color or your age or your sexuality. But I push everybody equally. And all of those people who made those movies made them for nothing, made them by scraping everything they had together. And every single one of them were and every single one of them contacted me to ask me for help for every stage of it. Not one woman has ever, in that 20 years, gone against the system to make their own movie. Don't call that unconscious bias and don't blame men. Because it's a fucking lie and you're better than that. All of the women here are better than that. Stop blaming these fucking imaginary, created, divisory tactics. And make your fucking movie. Because if you do, I'll help you whether I have a cock or not. <laughs> That's a great ideology. I wish everybody would take that on as well. I just got a surprise because I come from Ukraine and I see how different a little bit in the West, uh, it's like everybody feel discriminated by something. And I never felt discriminated as a woman. And no, nobody stopped me to go and go out. Nobody stopped me to make a film, and I feel great that people want to work with me, and they don't look where I'm from or anything like that. Uh, so it's great to see that somebody uh, happy to treat a person by a talent, but not the skin color, gender, or whatever that is, gay, whatever. If you can do something great. I'm happy to work with you. If you're a nice person, I'm happy to work with you. And um, well, it's just, just to uh, be clear, I draw the line of the gaze. They're out of touch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just uh, I, I felt a bit lonely in this kind of opinion. It's great to hear that somebody thinks the same way. So yeah. Well, thank you. But again, it's, it's I think it's what's your name? Me? Yeah. Uh, 
Eilish. Eilish. What age are you, Eilish? 22. 22. So you're 22 and you're smart. And I'm, I'm presuming already you're talented. But you could waste the next 10 years in an invisible constructed by people who don't give a fuck about you. Do you understand that? Artists. You talk, like, it's, it's interesting. If I'm looking for someone to blame for my inaction, I will find a million people to blame every day. If I'm looking for something to justify being blocked as a writer, I will come up with a billion ways to avoid sitting in front of a computer or a blank page. But you, Eilish, are 22 years of age. If you have the courage, regardless of what position you have in the hierarchy of any production, if you have the courage to go, this is impossible, this is going to war against the impossible, what can I do to create in a room a bunch of people who will suspend reality in order to create a piece of fiction that might transcend reality. Then we will follow you to the ends of fucking time. And we don't give a shit whether you have a vagina, a fucking penis, or whatever that thing is in the middle. <laughs> Does that make sense? Thank you. This man is from County Cork, ladies and gentlemen, so if anyone has any problems understanding him, I'll try and translate. Thanks, boy. Uh, how's it going? I know everyone's been asking kind of more philosophical questions, but this is kind of more of a technical question, just about writing. And when you go to write a feature and save your idea, what extent of preparation do you believe in before you actually start writing it and start writing scenes? Like, do you like to plan out every beat before you write a scene to go, do you have every scene planned before you write a scene, or sometimes do you just like to let the story develop as you write it and then kind of work out the structure a bit more in the rewrite? Again, there is no right and no wrong way, but there is writing and not writing. And writers come up to avoid writing. Sit down, look at a blank page and start to fucking write. That's the only way to write. Now, structure and form allows you, after the fact, to assess for your second draft what works, what doesn't, and why. And that's the real benefit and power of structure and form. But if you have a thematic question, it means that you have an idea of where you're going. So you're not completely lost. But just, you've got to sit down and write. And it's not just filling a page with fucking words. That's not writing. That's typing. It's having the functionary purpose for each scene. What do these characters want? What's stopping them getting it? What the fuck are they prepared to do to get it? And how are they altered by the consequence of getting it or failing to get it? What happens next? Those basic questions. If you're not asking those questions, you're not writing. Make sense? You know, um, some people in the room now might feel... Oh, oh cool. we ain't get a fucking haircut. Yeah, I, you made me feel really, you know, <laughs> self-conscious about my hair. But uh, maybe I just wanted to. <laughs> She's definitely a fucking actor. <laughs> so uh, some people in the room may be feeling uncomfortable. Some people may feel moved. Some people may be on the edge of their seat throughout this conversation. And that's why I wanted Terry to come here. Because Terry is willing to ask the questions that some people are not willing to ask, but are seething to ask and the conversation that you two just had I mean I was at the edge of my seat I was uh, I feel it's profound I feel we don't have enough of that today in this industry having people who don't have the same preconceptions opinions but are able to talk and discuss and not have it you know reduced to name calling or have it be aggressive yeah fuck you Elish <laughs> you know and, and that, that's how we come, that's what Kino is all about. It's all about being open, opening your mind to other perspectives, maybe perspectives that make you feel uncomfortable, but all the while opening, because that's what Kino is all about. It's all about expression, and it's all about opening the full gates to everything, and not picking and choosing and promoting things that we believe in. Fundamentally, I believe that art is about openness and expression, and I think that conversation there, I mean, I just really enjoyed it and I just wanted to say, well done for 
stand on by what you believe in. Simply. <laughs> and just for a second, don't stand by what you believe in if what you believe is bullshit. So, <laughs> I just wanted to get, take you guys back and I want to finish with this. In 2022, I discovered Kino and I went April 1st, 2022, I did my first ever Kino Cabaret. Like some of you today sitting in the chairs, I felt awkward. I felt like no one was talking to me. Why is no one approaching me? Why is no one coming? at their knees saying, Liam, speak to me. I want to hear everything that you have to say. And <laughs> through the process of that first keynote, I realized I'm an arrogant bastard. <laughs> but moreover, I believe that keynote is all about putting yourself out there and putting yourself into positions you're uncomfortable in because only in these positions can you truly grow. Shortly after I did my first keynote, I rang, I, co I basically cold called Terry McMahon Someone from Mullingar said, Terry is a man from Mullingar. He also makes films. You'd call him. <laughs> I did. And we spoke very briefly on the phone, but fundamentally what he said was, I was looking for something, some magic formula f for making a film or you know, so, p actual pieces of advice or contacts or whatever. And he said what I find to be one of the most profound pieces of advice I've ever been given, he's like, and he, and he said essentially, go out there and make a fucking movie. And essentially what he said, I could, you know, I could simplify it to one phrase. Terry McMahon basically said, make movies, not excuses. <laughs> I can't believe you ate that shit up. <laughs> this fucking second-hand car salesman gives you that shit and you all fucking whoop and applaud. Shame on you, bunch of cunts. Thank you, Terry. Uh, if anybody wants to go for a drink or whatever, let's if I want to have a conversation beyond this. I'm happy to talk beyond this. So, so shortly after this, we're gonna we're gonna have a break. We're gonna open the floor up to pitches. If you want to stay for the pitches, uh, fuck that. I'll see you all. <laughs> we'll have a screening um, Sunday. All the films will be screened. Just so you guys know, in case no one's heard, uh, this is a essentially open up to donations, so if you want to bring family members, we'll have more capacity than the 120 tickets, so if you have family and friends who want to come, um, feel free to invite people. And Terry, I hope to see you there on Sunday. <laughs> the most Westmead response ever. Anyway guys, thank you very much for attending the workshop, and I wish you the best of luck throughout the weekend. Make movies, no excuses, film up! Yeah.